Welcome, movie fans, to another episode of Hollow Victories, where the farce is strong with us. I am your host, Matt Presents, joined as always by my scruffy-looking nerf herder co-host. I'm not Mackle, I'm my own original character, Schmackle. That's not the thing you said the first time. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone um, forever. <laughs> it's not. Your end is, still exists. Uh, I, I don't have to. I don't have to show. I guess you have it. <laughs> this is uh, this is another classic Hollow Victories re-recording, and this time it is entirely Adobe Audition's fault. It 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 only recorded like half of what I said. And not even, like, a consecutive half. Like, it recorded the entire session. It was just, like, skipping around a lot. But it is kind of one of those situ- Like, Adobe has done this to me before. So, I'm- I'm- Part of me is, like, God damn it, like... I- I should have checked. I should have checked on it when it started being weird. This is, like, the third time we've done this, right? First time was Care Bears, second time was- I forget, but I know what happened another time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think this is our third re-record, and this is this is the first one that's uh, Adobe's fault. Usually, when it does that to me, I'm uh, g- generally when that happens to me, I'm recording something in live action, and I just end up using the audio on my phone, and it sounds bad. I'm glad that we have two live action episodes already, because if that ever happened to a live action episode, that would have been a bummer, like a real bummer. It did happen to the first time you and Mitzi uh, did a recorded in person, I think. Yeah, we we recorded in person, and then the my my computer was just like, nah, yeah, I'm gonna erase all this shit. <laughs> like any good computer would. Yeah, computers hate me. Technology hates me. Anyways, today we are talking about uh t- two Star Wars knockoffs that. Uh, have one Mr. Roger Corman's name attached to them. Now, one of them, he was the American distributor and didn't actually, like, have any involvement in making the film. The other one he was a producer on, so uh, one of these is more his fault than the other, but his (laughs) name is at least attached to both of these. It's uh, Battle Beyond the Stars versus Star Crash. Which one was he more responsible for? Uh, He produced Battle Beyond the Stars... Star Crash is an Italian film that he imported. Mmm, okay. Uh, I'll be honest, I was really dreading this one because I I, I just, I, I, I'm always less, I, and I think that they're good episodes, I think we've gotten a good episode, but we do like a Star Wars every year, and I don't have investment in the good Star Wars movies, so how am I going to have investment in the bad ones? <laughs> I will say, with that being said, one of these two movies, which I think once we start talking about them, I think will become apparent which one really quick. One of these two movies, I really had a good time watching. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I I was surprised we got an hour's worth of conversation about it two weeks ago before the holidays. Yeah, uh, this episode might be like forty five minutes. <laughs> Anyways. Michael, would you like to introduce Battle Beyond the Stars? Sure. Battle Beyond the Stars, uh, uh, directed by Jimmy T. Murakami, released in 1980, tells the story of a man named Shad, who his planet is under attack, so he needs to go out and gather mercenaries in this ship that is not his, but he has piloted successfully a few times. The, The ship has a AI that is able to speak to him and basically just feels like an actual person as a very intelligent AI named Nell. And through their journey, most of the movie is just them gathering different troops and you get like little different scenes on each planet or each place they travel to, including a space cowboy, a rich assassin who has all the wealth in the world, but also can't go anywhere because he is wanted by basically everybody. A woman whose dad really wants him to fuck her for some reason. And then this uh, really horny woman with the most unflattering sit-down pose imaginable that they clearly thought was supposed to be sexy, but hey, what you gonna do? And then the movie just ends with them all dying. (laughs) (laughs) What did you think of this movie, Matt? Um, I mean, it's so much less than the sum of its parts. 
<laughs> like, there's a lot of stuff in this movie that I like. There's a lot of ideas in this movie that I, I think were good ideas. But it, it never, like, coalesces into anything. It's just like, meet a bunch of cool characters. Okay, we're gonna fight the bad guy. Right. The end. <laughs> they And they are good characters. Um, I don't know, if you want to do a... I feel like if you want to do a story where you're going to kill a bunch of the characters off like that, you either want to do it in a sequel, which, to be fair, this movie had a realistic expectation of whether a sequel would happen or not. <laughs> they essentially <laughs> broke themselves into a corner where that couldn't happen. But also, um, I, don't, I don't know, like, I, I remember, like, one that was very effective to me as a kid was the Hobbit movie, because the animated one, because a ton of characters die in that movie. But it's also a movie that goes on over the course of years, I think. Like, you're seeing a lot of time pass. And this one, it's just like, they die on their first mission together. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you don't really get to flesh out the characters or explore them before just giving them the axe. The, the main male lead and the main female lead are the two that live and they're easily, they're not terrible, but they're easily the least two interesting characters. Because <laughs> they're kind of just like the hero and the love interest, and that's it. Yeah. We made fun of this guy for being kind of dweeby. And we admitted that Luke Skywalker is a little dweeby. Yeah. At least in the first Star Wars movie. Yeah. I, I God, I remember reading a book that was like supposed to be Luke Skywalker's journal during the time of of the first Star Wars movie, and he is so whiny and annoying in that book. <laughs> I, I really did not like that book. <laughs> That's this guy. This guy is that version of Luke <laughs> from that book. He just didn't really make much, leave much of an impact, but it's like... Yeah, honestly, he's not even annoying enough to be that Luke. <laughs> he, he, like, uh, and to be honest with you, I, I think that... The main reason the original Luke Skywalker has left an impact on people, because I don't, yeah, looking back at that first movie, I think he is the least interesting part of it. But I think one sequel's helped with that, you know, like, he has some pretty iconic moments in the second movie. But I think, like, yeah, I think that stuff, like, kind of helped the the character become more memorable, be, grow a little bit. Obviously, Luke Skywalker is a very famous character, but yeah, I... I I, yeah, I, th I think the thing that really works about Luke is that he's just kind of this nobody kid, and, and then he goes through this crazy arc yeah. of, of <laughs> the shit that happens in those movies. This kid doesn't have much of an arc. He, his, his whole thing is just like, he finds these assassins and hires them to, to f help fight his planet's enemy. Yeah, the other thing I, I was about to say it and I forgot it, um, is that I I think, you know, also Luke Skywalker is a good, like, kind of put yourself into the main role kind of character. Yeah. Um, I think that's always been a big part of the appeal to him. At least again, like the later movies, even like the sequel trilogy, like definitely flesh Luke out a bit like more. He's he's definitely not the self insert character by the end of the movies. But um but at first, I think that's kind of what he was. In this movie, it's like, what are you inserting yourself into? You know, like, it's... <laughs> it doesn't work quite the same way. Yeah. No, he's... He's not quite Luke Skywalker. <laughs> now, funny enough, we were kind of calling, like, the cowboy character in this movie. We're like, ah, oh, now they got Luke and Han. But then, like, he just leaves the cowboy behind, and he meets that other bounty hunter guy who's arguably more like Han Solo than the cowboy guy was. And and then he barely does anything with that guy either until the big final battle. Like, at, at th this whole movie, this whole movie is just the scene where Luke meets Han over and over and over. <laughs> I think the only thing that separates that guy from, like, Han Solo is that I think that, like, Han Solo does have, like, a bit more of a fun personality than him where he just kind of seems to strut. Yeah, now he's somewhere between, like, the cowboy and the the bounty hunter with all the money that he can't spend. Yeah, yeah. Um, both, both of those two characters are good ideas for characters that are different enough from Han Solo, where if they were actually explored properly, they could be good. They could be good characters in an RPG, you know? Like, I've, I've been doing a lot of, like, RPGs lately, and, like, both of those could be fun party members to have and get to know them better. It's, like, it's just the movie, you don't, yeah, like, you don't get much outside of the introduction. 
I told you this. I swear to God, I wrote a script when I was younger that had this exact cowboy character in it. <laughs> I have never seen this movie before. This is my first time watching this movie. And I just, like, I, I happen to have written a script about, like, a cowboy from Earth who who's, like, super into Earth movies. And he's, like, the only character from Earth. Who else? He meets the brain people. The brain people are kind of interesting. They're kind of interesting, and the movie actually does a little bit with them later on, too. Like, I think, it, I feel like they, I feel like they almost got used the right amount because they're not characters you really need to dive into their personality too much, especially since there's almost a lack of it intentionally. But they do have a pretty fun scene where they're, like, the main villain who does, like, he loses his arm and he wants to use one of theirs, but because they're all kind of one hive mind, they're able to use the arm to try to get him to slit his own throat. I, I don't know, that, 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 that scene was kind of weird to me just because, like, nothing became of it, right? And I think that's the, I think that's the problem. It's another fun idea that we're not, it doesn't really go anywhere. But, uh, but I liked the characters in that scene. He can't control the arm, so he cuts it off in the same scene that it's attached. That did not go anywhere. If this was, like, a parody movie like Spaceballs, they could have kept that going much longer, and it could have been really funny, you know? Like, it, it's a good idea. Um, but it's like, uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's another... It's Because, it, again, this, you're, you're, we, we kind of said it already, but, it, yeah, this is a movie that's full of great ideas that don't they don't, like, explore them at all. It's kind of like... They had the idea, they write it down, and then they stop talking about it. Yeah. I Here's the thing. I, I, I think both of these films go on a little too long. Battle Beyond the Stars goes on way, way longer than it needs to. Star Crash, it's only a little bit. Star Crash, there's a little bit near the end where I'm like, okay, you, you, you could have you gotten us through this a little faster. This movie, you're like ready for it to end, and you look, and there's like... 20 minutes left and you're like oh my god what what could we possibly do in this 20 minutes just end it man yeah it, it does it does drag at the end a lot and i kind of had fun at the end of the movie but it was exclusively because chris joined the call with us and me and chris were just like making a comment every five seconds like it was like we're, we were kind of getting bored by the movie so that's what it like that's what it turned into was like a bad stand-up <laughs> like uh, so, cause like, I feel like, uh, I feel like there is laughing at what a so bad it's good movie gives you. And then there is coming up with your own material because the movie isn't giving it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Both can be very fun experiences. That doesn't make Battle Beyond the Stars because just because me and Chris had a lot of fun at the end laughing at it. That doesn't mean Battle Beyond the Stars is one that's worth revisiting. <laughs> oh God, no, no, I, I couldn't watch this again. It's, it's a real, it's pretty dull like i i would watch a remake of it maybe yeah. like if if they tried this again tr tr like toned it down used a few of the characters in this it could be a good could could be a good movie potentially but uh this this is not a good movie right yeah no it is not uh it, it's like it's not like bottom of the list for me and honestly i don't even think that i think i dislike it less than you do like we kind of we have that kind of a lot back and back and forth uh i will say this is something that we didn't talk about last episode and this is just a fun little side note because there's a big list of like um remakes of this movie called seven samurai and battle beyond the stars is considered one of them this is like considered an adaptation of a movie called seven samurai which was from like it's an old movie let's see i think it's from 19 1950s yeah no that's that's uh, one of Kurosawa's films. People really consider this a seventh. That's a stretch. It's what it's listed as. Like it's. Let's see. Uh, the film is intended as a magnificent, magnificent seven in outer space. It based the plots of the Magnificent Seven and Seven Samurai. The movie acknowledges its debt to Seven Samurai by calling the protagonist homeworld Akira, and inhabits the Akira. So I guess that's what it is. Maybe it's more so inspired than... Because, like, Wikipedia is listed at... Not even Wikipedia. Google is listed as an adaptation. And perhaps that... Perhaps... Perhaps someone's stretching with that. Maybe it's more of, like, inspi inspiration, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I guess. I've never seen Seven Samurai, but it's very well received. I, I, I've I seen it. Is it good? I kind of pref prefer Magnificent Seven, honestly. 
which is like the American Western adaptation. I think the pacing's a little better. I think I think the original is like kind of slow. And it is like over three hours, that one. This one's only two hours, so that sounds about right. Yeah, I mean, aside from like talking about cast, which we can do, I don't have much else to say about this. Do you have anything else to say? I mean, I have things to say as we as we go through these characters, but uh no, we can we can like start talking about these cast members. I feel like we've already talked about Luke Skywalker enough. Yeah, Richard Thomas as Shad. There were a few points in the film where it sounded like a character called him Chat. <laughs> so like, hey Chat, watch this. Chat, can you help me? Like XQC, chat, chat, we got to do this chat. Uh, Robert Vaughn as Gelt, the man with all the money that he can't spend because he is wanted everywhere. He's kind of... I, uh, the the actor Robert Vaughn is like a good actor. He's he's kind of over. He he was in the Magnificent Seven actually, but he he was he was trying a little hard in this one. Not even trying a little hard. He he was just honestly probably not trying that hard. Just kind of like, oh yeah, I'm so dark and brooding. But I don't know. He's a good enough actor that it kind of works. It, I think in the uh, like the tone of this movie too, if it being a little silly, it's kind of like. It could work. I, I I was open to his. I was very open to his character, but you know, yeah, it's not like the script's given this guy much to work with. I will say, like yeah. George Peppered as the cowboy. I think the script, like dialogue wise, does give him stuff to work with. It's just character and plot wise, it doesn't give him much. But he has some good interactions in this movie. Yeah, I think he's the best person in this movie. Honestly, he's. Oh, that's 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 fucking Hannibal from the A Team. Hey. Damn. Yeah, he was listed in a couple things. He was in Breakfast at Tiffany's. That's a that's a big movie. I never saw the movie. That's a very famous movie. There's a fucking song about it and all that. Is. John Saxon as the villain Sador. <laughs> God, what a fucking it's a dumb it's a dumb name for a villain, but uh Sador John Saxon. I love seeing John Saxon in anything. And he he chews scenery here, but he he still kind of understood the assignment. He He's a sci-fi villain. He should be chewing scenery. <laughs> this is a character who is meant to chew scenery. Darlene Flugel as the, the love interest. She has been in other movies. She is fine. I don't remember her being, I like, mean, bad. We but... say this a lot. We say this a lot, but, like, the script didn't give him a lot to work with. Right, she's just kind of the love interest, and her dad's kind of a freak. I think the dad's more notable than her. Dr. Dr. Hef Hephaestus. Dr. Hephaestus, played by Sam Jaffe. Okay. He's been in, like, some, like, classic 50s sci-fi movies. Like, well, well-known sci-fi actor from the 50s. Yeah. You got S Sybil Danning... As Saint Exon, <laughs> the 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 Valkyrie warrior, who who whose seat is like built to like push out her tits, but it just looks really awkward. <laughs> like clearly the intent was like, haha, we're gonna emphasize her tits, but then you see her and it's like, that doesn't look like a comfortable seat to sit in. What is going on here? <laughs> Kind of just makes her look sluggish too. Like I don't think I think it has the opposite effect of what they're trying to do. The comparison I made the last time we recorded this episode is like that episode of South Park where they're playing War World of Warcraft. She looks <laughs> like the gamer that like does nothing but play World of Warcraft in that episode. That's what she looks like in that position. Just leaned too far back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, she kind of looks like all of the boys in the episode, too. Because, yeah, that's the point. Is it's just like you're not... It, it's That's not a flattering position to sit in, you know? This, uh, this is Sybil Danning, who's like a famous, like, B-movie sex icon. And when I saw her name in the credits, I'm like, all right, Sybil Danning. I have to keep an eye out for her. When this character showed up on screen, I'm like, yeah, that's Sybil Danning. Like, I, do. I don't even need to check the credits. I can, I, th this is a Sybil Danning character. This is who she is playing. I, I think there, that there's also, you know, potential for her character to be fun, too, because I kind of like how her involvement with the mercenaries is that she just kind of invites herself. Like, Shad doesn't want her there. And it's not because he, like, doesn't 
thinks that she's a threat or doesn't trust her. It's just he, he seems more than anything to be annoyed by her. It's just like, nah, fuck this. I don't want I don't want to work with this person. <laughs> and then she just shows up anyway and just like forces herself to be part of the team. <laughs> and I think that's funny. I think that's like a there could be like a funny dynamic there. But also there's a scene in the movie where you can see someone behind her seat. Just someone who clearly wasn't oh, yeah. supposed to be present there. Just, yeah, just someone working on the movie who was just kind of chilling behind the seat. And at first I thought I might have been seeing stuff, but no, there's multiple shots and he is moving around back there. You can see him. Maybe maybe the lore reason, it's just, the lore explanation is it's just she had a stalker. It's This is like in the Ninja Turtles movie where they open their mouths and you can see a guy's face inside. <laughs> Like the old one with the puppets. Right, yeah, yeah, I know. I know it's not the Michael Bay one. That would be really funny if it was in the Michael Bay one because that would have been a direct <laughs> reference. That would have been, that would have that would have made me respect Michael Bay a little bit more. That'd be like, okay, the guy has a sense of humor. Is there anyone else in this movie you would like to talk about? Not not really that we haven't talked about. Actors, okay. The hive mind characters, like I said, they had a moment or two that was fun, but they're like there's not much to the personality because it's like kind of the point that there's not much to their personality. They're supposed to be really calm and calm characters who all act the same way. But it's an okay idea. Yeah. So uh, this is directed by Jimmy T. Murakami, who was mostly known for animation outside of this. He did the the opening like car animation for heavy metal. Um. He did the famous movie The Snowman and the somewhat infamous movie When the Wind Blows, which is just kind of known for being, like, super dark and depressing. Yeah. But y you know what else he directed? What else did he direct? The the Tootsie Pop commercial where the owl bites into the Tootsie Pop. I can see it now that you mention that. <laughs> yeah, that that's like a similar art style. It's weird that he did- this is, like, one of two live-action things he ever worked on. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Looking at his lit track list. I mean, like the, the other one's a movie called monster. I think like that one looks like it's live action. Or is it humanoids from the deep? Why did they, it has two names. Humanoids. Humanoids from the deep. Yeah. Yeah. It has, it has two names. Old movies be like that sometimes. Humanoids in the deep is the, the title I've seen it under. And he wasn't even like the lead director. He was a, like assistant director on that. I know that much. You know who else worked on this movie? I know who you're going to say, but go for it. I, yeah, I did this to you last time. You, you probably remember. <laughs> so uh, in the special effects department on this film is one Mr. James Cameron. Yes. Who Who is one of the many, like, big-name directors who has gotten their start with Roger Corman. Roger Corman used to be, like, a, a really good, like, entryway into the... Like, the Hollywood system. He he would put up a little money, you could make your first film, and then the big studios would be like, okay, come make a big studio movie. Because uh, Francis Ford Coppola got his start with, with Corman, James Cameron got his start with Corman, Joe Dante got his start with Corman, Paul Bartel, uh, Jonathan Demme, all, all directors who started with, with Roger Corman. Clint Howard's brother. Um, Ron Howard, Ron Howard got his start with, <laughs> with uh, making films with Roger Corman, although he was a child actor before that. I mean, like, this is not an actor, but like another person who worked on this movie who seems to have done a lot of work with Mr. Cameron is, uh, James Horner was a composer for this movie who, this was like kind of the start of his career. And ever since then, you know, I mean, he's, I, he passed away in like 2015, but he, he did, he did Avatar. He did a beautiful mind. He did a brave heart. He did aliens. Um, I think, yeah, he did Titanic. Like he did a lot of work with James Cameron. And obviously this was like one of the first things they worked on together, you know, major composer for this film. And the funny thing is like, he's a good, com he's a good composer. Cause I mean, I like some of the scores these, and I think a beautiful mind. I really like the score of that movie actually. The music in the movie we're about to talk about actually is kind of memorable, and I do like it. This movie, I don't remember any of it. I don't think it was bad. I don't remember the score being annoying or anything. Like, there was never a track where I was like, ooh, this sucks. But to be fair, very rarely is a movie score that bad. The, m the most common movie scores are just generic, you know? Yeah. And this one definitely falls under generic. <laughs> like, he got so much better. Maybe if I listened to it again, I would change my opinion on that. That has happened before. 
but like oh man this one was like just like it was like nothing yeah it it feels kind of like exactly what you'd expect from a star wars knockoff yeah like it's trying to sound like star wars music but not quite be star wars music right i guess that like ties into another point i was gonna mention is i don't like from a technical standpoint we haven't really talked about too much this movie is pretty well made like for the time like it's competent enough but there's nothing special about it where i think where the movie we're about to talk about yeah. there is something special about it with this one it's like yeah the job was done the people who like you know people who set up shots they knew stuff about they knew something about composition it's not bad the effects were fine the you know camera work fine the sets fine nothing I don't think there's a single set that's like memorable in this movie though. I don't think that there's like anything visually about this. The most like visually memorable scene is probably the scene where he goes up and meets the people in the hive mind just because that set was a little weirder. And even then it's not that great. It's just kind of like a white room, but it's the only part of the movie I remember being like kind of distinct. <laughs> so but it's 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 a competently made movie. That's something that's worth mentioning because the last time we talked about Star Wars knockoffs uh they were not very competently made. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, this is still Roger Corman. This is still Hollywood. This is still right. Like they, it's it's low budget, but like a, a Turkish Star Wars was like no budget, <laughs> and and you can kind of respect it a little bit more because of that. Um, but it's like, yeah, this one's just kind of like it, it's serviceable. People went to went to work and they did their job. But because, you know, I think it's worth mentioning the technical aspect because there's plenty of movies where the technical aspect gets brought up in a negative or positive way. This in this one, it is fine, but there is not really anything specific to compliment. In fact, I think some of the costumes are bad. I think that the hive mind characters I keep mentioning kind of <laughs> I think they kind of look bad. They look like they belong in something like Turkish Star Wars. Yeah, I could see those characters being in Turkish Star Wars, honestly. <laughs> All right. If you've got nothing else, I'm I'm prepared to move on to Star Crash. Let's talk about Star Crash. We we did end up talking about that one longer than I kind of expected us to. There's stuff to say about but both I, of them. There's, yeah, that's the thing. There's stuff to say about it, but it's like, what does it amount to? A kind of boring movie. So let's talk about a, a movie where that is not the case. Star Crash from 1978. So this is just one year after Star Wars has come out. Uh, this follows the adventures of uh, smuggler Stella Star and her crewmate, Acton. Stella Star and Acton are, are captured by, you know, the Empire, by, by the, the, the people who are in charge of the area. But they, they break out of prison and are then recruited by the Emperor to go to this planet where a ship has crashed and find the people who are on it and along the way there is constant attack and and backstabbing from uh the villain of this movie count zarth arn what a name count zarth arn causes trouble for them along the way finally they meet like the emperor's son and then do battle with with count zarth arn michael what'd you think of this movie I had a lot of fun with this one. Um, I think that it, it... I can't call it a good movie, per se, but I think that there are aspects of the movie that are genuinely good, and then a lot of aspects that are just, like, so bad they're good. But it is entertaining. I think it's one of the more entertaining Hollow Victory movies we've watched. I think that there's a very home movie feeling to a lot of it where a lot of it's being made with toys and some of the sets are like green screen, but they're green screened with a lot of layers. They didn't just like find some generic space background. They went like, Oh, like we have this big space station, but then outside we have like some, it looks like the background to some like lo-fi music video on YouTube, like where the, the sun, like where the moon is like purple and the sky is like a blue. It's like, they they had fun with colors in this movie. They had fun with the sets. They are like they they're doing these like big action scenes with toys, <laughs> but there's a lot of moving pieces to the toys. Like it's like it's it feels like something that was made by people that didn't have a lot to work with that tried to utilize everything they did have the best they could, and I I I found it to be a very charming and enjoyable movie. 
Um, it's not to say that everything about it is even something that I like, but there's a lot that I enjoy about this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like we tip our hands early on this show, but this is one where it's like, no, Star Crash was fun. <laughs> Battle Beyond the Stars was not. <laughs> I'm sorry if you were here to, if you, if, if you, if you know, if you, if you're only here for the to find out who the victor is because yeah it's going to be star crash but i i'm here for the discussion i love having these discussions even if i know one movie's going to win i'm like nah i just want us to talk about these films yeah and and star crash is an interesting film to ca- compare to battle beyond the stars because there are things that both of them do <laughs> that are like similar yeah I, they both have they both have like sentient ships that talk, which is not something in Star Wars. <laughs> so Star Wars was missing. Hmm. I'm not sure it was. <laughs> Cause honestly, like like Battle Beyond the Stars was not that good, and then the the, the talking ship in this one doesn't do much. No. Kind of forgettable. Uh, yeah, honestly. I probably would have forgot if you didn't mention it. In in the grand scheme of like the insanity of this movie. But that's the thing, like, like, Battle Beyond the Stars, it's like, okay, here's some good ideas, and they're kind of put together haphazardly, and it, it doesn't coalesce into anything. This, I think, doesn't really coalesce into anything, but all of the scenes are insane on their own. <laughs> Every scene in this movie is just, like, fun to watch. Most of the scenes, I shouldn't say every scene, but like most of the scenes in this movie are so fun to watch. Right. Just just weird stuff happening constantly. There's like a, a Darth Vader looking robot with a southern accent. I love it when robots have accents. <laughs> and not not even like like British accents. Like British accent robot is too obvious. Give me southern accent robot. Oh yeah, it's the redneck redneck robot. I think that uh, his name is L and I think that L is one of the great Hall of Victories characters. He's up there with Big Joe Grizzly and Nicholas. <laughs> and and Big Fatso. And Big Fatso. And Big Fatso. That's th- that's the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Yeah, right there. I do want to do a video eventually, just kind of as like a promo for Hollow Victories, but just like top ten best and top ten worst Hollow Victory characters. And I'm sure all five of the ones we just named to make it on the top five, top ten. Uh, who's who's the worst character? I I gotta like look back at that because it's kind of like, it, there's like some honest to god some of them might even come from one of the some of the movies that i put higher up on the list like i think an eight crazy nights character could absolutely make the top 10 worse (laughs) but i do like that movie more than a lot of what we've watched because there's other aspects of it that it has going for it but is it okay is it fair to say (laughs) Sokka? Just because he's like he would, so not fucking Sokka. Oh, I, I thought about the list in my head before I'm where I would go and Sokka would be on there for sure. Like no, 100% <laughs> Sokka's on the top 10 worst. I don't know if he's number one. Because uh, honest to God, if I was going to pick an 8 Crazy Nights character, I might just pick I might just pick uh, Rob Schneider's Asian character. <laughs> you are all on crack. Yeah. Sounds to me like you are all on crack. Huh? Slams face into table. <laughs> Jumping back to Star Crash here. <laughs> I I do think near the end, the battle stuff maybe goes on a little too long. But even that, there's a lot of fun parts too. Like, l- characters will get shot and it's it's like some extra who is here for one scene to get shot and they just like put their all into it they are they are like flailing around and giving the biggest performance of their life to get shot in one shot of star crash <laughs> but then you also have count zartharn who is just there like saying do it kill them kill them <laughs> like and he's doing nothing <laughs> he's like the lamest villain in any movie out of any of these movies that we watch but he's going into it the intensity of someone who actually is doing something <laughs> he's just like go get them kill and it's it's like are you gonna do anything are you just gonna like stand there you go to the desert 
Oh yeah, no, he he's he's really funny in this because uh, he's such a fucking he's such a shitty villain, but he's going into it with so much energy <laughs> still. Like he still has that energy that the guy in the last movie had, but he's just like doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, he's this this villain gives me more like Flash Gordon villain vibes than than Star Wars villain. <laughs> right. This movie is like very similar to Flash Gordon in a lot of ways. I feel that. I think I think the Flash Gordon movie from 1980 kind of puts itself together better. Oh, for sure. Like, there is a, a narrative to that film. And it feels a lot more self-aware. Like, it feels like it's... Yes. It, it fully yeah. has embraced what it is. I think it having a Queen soundtrack is a good sign of that. Like, clearly they were, they were having fun with this, and clearly they were able to get other, you know, popular... You know, get a very popular band to see the fun in that like yeah it just felt like it felt like a completed picture while this feels like a lot of what works about it wasn't on purpose (laughs) yeah yeah fair but there's similarities for sure let's let's talk about the cast because there's just so many people we got to talk about i want to start by drawing attention to sort of the male lead of the film acton played Mm. by marjo gortner Marjo is famous as, like, the youngest uh, ordained minister of all time. He he was, like, a child preacher for a while. There's a whole documentary about him as a child preacher. And, and so when he showed up in this movie, I'm like, that guy looks familiar. And then I'm like, it's the kid preacher dude from Marjo? <laughs> <laughs> and there's, like... Once you know that, it, it, there are, like, scenes it, where, where he's giving a performance and you're like, yeah, no, it kind of checks out that this kid was, he, that he was, like, a child preacher. He's an adult in this movie, but it's, like, kind of checks out that he was uh, a, a preacher before this. Right. He, apparently, late in his life, he, he got into, like, acting and, and like, songwriting, I think, or, or musical performance, at least. But he, he appears in a few movies... This was probably his biggest role right. outside of, like, the documentary about him. Mm-hmm. Just just a strange actor to see show up in this. I thought it was the greatest American hero for a second, but it was not. It was Marjo. I think it needs to be said of, of like, the actors in this movie. Every single actor in this film is giving a different performance. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of them is performing in a different movie. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. I, I'll say this, like, I remember, like, the one who feels, like, closest to, like, anything sci-fi is Christopher Plummer as the Emperor. Because he's given some, he's given a performance that I, I could imagine seeing, like, my dad watching, like, an old Star Trek episode, you know? Like, I, I could, like, okay, he's got that energy. But then you have L who... L could be a fucking Rick and Morty character. Like, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Christopher Plummer is probably the closest thing to, like... I mean, I mean, like, he is a good actor. He is a legitimate actor. Right. And he gives, like, one of the better performances. It's also kind of boring in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Because he's just, like, giving the performance you expect. You're like, okay, well, that was Christopher Pl- Plummer as the Emperor... Right. Which does still kinda add to the weirdness. Then then you've got, you know, the, the former child preacher Marjo. You've got uh Carolyn Monroe as Stella Starr, who's kinda not a good actress. Like she's kinda giving a very underwhelming performance. It is I do enjoy it. I do enjoy her character. She, there's kind of like a campiness to it. Where I feel like she's trying way too hard on certain lines and not trying hard enough on others. Like she it feels like <laughs> it feels like there was times on set where she got like really into it. And other times where they said, Okay, all right, okay, Caroline, we gotta come over here and do a shot. She's like, Fine. Like it's just like <laughs> she she's very all over the place in this, but I do think it, it is like an entertaining performance. There's some line deliveries that are really weird. And I, I will say also her and the pair up of L was one I was not expecting. Cause like, you know, L does disappear at a point in this movie. They kill him off. He comes back, but he, they kill him off for a bit in kind of an unsatisfying way. But 
for a while, they're like the duo in this movie. And again, I did not, you know, you see this like redneck Darth Vader at the start of the movie and you kind of think he's just going to be like an open and of the movie bad guy. Then he turns into one of the main characters. I think we compared it to fucking last record. We compared him to like Glip Glop in the one community episode, like the Yuba Duba Duba guy where he was just like this weird character that everybody took a liking to. So they kept including him in the movie. <laughs> yeah, but but unlike unlike that guy uh l starts you think he's a villain but the twist is he's a good guy right right i love that that's one of my favorite com- I, it's at the end of the show and it's still one of the best community episodes <laughs> that's and that's saying something I, I i do like that one that's season six is such a mixed bag but that's one of the good ones from that season yeah that's why i can't like totally write it off that one and the finale are like made season six worth it but yeah it's a rough season yeah, yeah. The uh, but she, I think her, she just has fun chemistry with another character in this. Like I think that they're, it works. It, it wouldn't. She is not someone I want to see in a lot of other movies. In this movie, I th- I think she belongs in Star Crash specifically. I think she belongs in this movie. That's what I'll say. Yeah, David Hasselhoff is in this movie. I think he's the worst part of it, to be honest. He's yeah, like I I like Hasselhoff, but like. He does nothing. He shows up like as the replacement for L, and he's like nowhere near as fun as L. He's not even as fun as Act- Acton, you know. He comes in and he looks similar to Acton. First of all, yeah, he kind of just takes over as main character. He even has more more of a focus than Cella at that point. But it's just like you, you introduced him way too late. Like you know that fucking in Labyrinth that Fox character that they add near the very end of the movie. Like what if like when he came on into the movie, like he was a very late addition in the movie. What if the movie just focused on him for the rest of it? That's, that's what it would be like. It would just, it doesn't, it, when you, it's okay. If you have like an ensemble cast and you keep adding characters, that's perfectly fine. Don't make the character you introduce near the end of the movie, take over as main character. That's never a good idea. And I've seen people do that before. This isn't the first time I've seen that. It's I hate it. And he's just, he's just not interesting. He's not an interesting character. Joe Spinell is Count, uh, Count Zarthon. Is that, is that his name? Hold on. Yeah, you you got it. Zartharn. Zartharn. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Joe Spinell is a guy who, like, was famous for playing really sleazy dudes, particularly in movies set in New York City. He actually did quite a few with Carolyn Monroe. Uh, probably his best known film is Maniac. Or he, he's, like, a, a psychotic killer. I mean, he's in some, like, bigger name movies. Like, he, he appears in, like, one of the Godfather movies and Rocky and, and Taxi Driver. But he's such a minor character in those. Right. Like, his real, his big roles were, like, horror movies where he was a killer or something. Mm-hmm. And he's so good in this. <laughs> I love Count Sarthar. He's such a funny villain. I enjoyed him. You've also got... Chief Thor, (laughs) who is just, like, the generic idea of a sci-fi character. (laughs) You made a funny comparison with him. Yeah, and it's it's more of a visual comparison than a personality comparison. But he looks like... He looks like Kif... A mix of Kif and Zap Brannigan from Futurama. Because he's got the outfit of outfit very similar to Zap Brannigan's. He has, like, the, like, the figure of Zap Brannigan... But then, he, like, his face and skin tone looks like Kiff. Yeah, and he's got the pointy ears. The like pointy Kif. ears, bald head, yeah, like, he... It just reminded me so much of Futurama seeing that guy. And I feel like if anyone else watched this movie, they'd see where I'm coming from. I think it's like... No, I, 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 I thought it was an apt comparison. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. I wonder if they watched... The people who made Futurama were big Star Crash fans. Yeah, um, is there anyone else in the cast? I mean, he's fine. He's like, he's just like a, he's kind of like the midpoint villain. You know, he's the villain that they take out halfway through the movie. We'll, we'll call on Judd Ham. We'll, we'll call out Judd Hamilton, who played L. One of only three movies he has been in. One of the others being a, a Joe Spinell, Carolyn Monroe horror film, the last horror film. I don't know if he's, if I, it's hard to tell if you can call him a good actor from this movie or not. But you can say that for this movie, he like got the assignment down because he is so he is the best part yeah. of this movie. Yeah. And I mean, uh, part part of that I think also is like his character design. I mean, he does 
he does kind of look like a penis. Yeah. That's something we didn't talk about. There's a lot of scenes in this film that feel like they're like straight out of a Star Wars porn parody. Just just like the sex never happens. <laughs> I mean, especially of Stella. Stella I mean, that's, Star. That's that we didn't mention. No matter... She actually, like, I, I think you're the one who pointed it out in the first uh, first time we recorded this, that she actually gains more clothes than as the movie goes on, but... Yeah, she 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 starts out in, like, skimpy outfit, and then, like, the longer it goes on, the more clothes she puts on. There's, like, a scene at the beginning of the movie where she's, like, in a prison, like, a work prison, and she's in a bikini, essentially. That scene is so stupid. We compared that to, like, the, the Earthbenders being tr- surrounded by <laughs> Earth in, in Last Airbender. Because, like, like, one gunshot at this core and the whole building blows up. Right. <laughs> like, like, the first time anyone tries to escape, the whole building explodes. <laughs> Yeah, very silly. It was a very silly scene. It was, like, very abrupt, too. Good special effects in this movie. There's, like, some stop-motion stuff that reminds me of Ray Harryhausen. I looked to see if it was him, and it was not. But, like, the the shot, like, the robot on the beach character is, like, pretty much straight up a ripoff of uh, uh, Jason and the Argonauts. A shot Harryhausen did in Jason and the Argonauts. There's like a statue on the beach that attacks them, and it's like, yeah, this is the same scene. You just stole a scene from from Jason and the Argonauts, and you know what? It works. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the effects are kind of neat. I will say this one is like, I- I'd say both these movies do a lot to separate themselves from Star Wars, but this one definitely does the more deliberately rip off Star Wars with the lightsabers. And because they just use lightsabers in it, like that's there's no there's no trying to call it something. I don't think they call them lightsabers, but they're not not calling them lightsabers either. They're not like they're not call. I don't think they come up with their own name for it. You know? Yeah. I w- I will say with a lot of the effects too, and like this isn't like this is this I I actually this is one of those things where it's like I'm already saying this movie has a home movie feeling to it, and I'm just gonna call all the shit charm, and you can disagree, but. The fucking screen, like, the quality drops so much when they do special effects like that. Because clearly they were doing something with the film. Every single time they did the effect, effects used to work very differently. What I compared it to is I told you a story about how I I couldn't do special effects when I was younger, but I had a friend who could. So I would send him the footage and he would, like, send it back with the effects. But I couldn't figure out how to download the footage, so I literally recorded it with my camera. So whenever there were special effects in my videos, it cut to... Went from actual footage to a recording of my computer screen. <laughs> yeah, and that's it, it, the all of the shots with special effects in this definitely ha- there's like a drop in quality. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a visible drop in in the quality of the the shot. But I mean that happened in those old Ray Harryhausen movies too. Like, that was just kind of something that happened back in the day. We were still trying to figure shit out, and we didn't know the most uh, effective way to put effects into films. Or if, uh... And for those who figured it out, they either didn't share their secrets, or it costed money. I want to talk about the director of this film. Sure. Luigi Cosi. who's kind of a weird... Kind of an interesting figure in, like, Italian horror. Because he was close with a lot of, like the really famous Italian horror directors he was he was in with Dario Argento and and Lucio Fulci and and all them so he he has gone on to be like a great historical source for for that era of Italian filmmaking he didn't make a lot of movies himself he's probably best known for like some Hercules movies he did with uh Lou Ferrigno like he's a (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> kind of an interesting figure because he 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 was he was in with all of these like really big popular directors but he didn't make that many movies and none of them were really that popular right and now now he owns like a bookshop in Italy this is one of his better movies i think like i've seen a few luigi casi movies and this is one where i'm like nah this is thoroughly entertaining not all of his films are right I, like, I haven't seen any of his other movies, but I could believe that. It's, uh, 
there's a lot of pieces that came together with this one to make it what it is. Is there anything else you have to say about this film? Just that I really like some of the sets too. Like some of them are green screen, but like I said, with multiple layers. I, t- I said that already, but there's some where they like did some like really crazy stuff where it's like it's not even necessarily well made. It doesn't. It's not following rules of comp- composition. Like it's there's some very funky looking shots in this movie where they green screened it, but it, it's still like interesting. It's still like interesting to see how they approached it. This movie stands out in a lot of ways, but then there were some sets like the first, one of the scenes where they're like, it's the scene where, um, Atkin dies. He, uh, that set is like kind of interesting. Actually, it's a built set. It's not a green screen. And it's also, uh, it's like very symmetrical. There's some interesting details. Like it's well lit. It has like a good color scheme. Like it's a, there there's good, uh, like it's just a pretty, like, not only well made uh sheet but uh not, what the fuck am i saying not well made sh- uh set but it's um it kind of stands out too i feel like i feel like this movie does have a lot of personality to it i do think that there's like people in this movie who were phoned it in um probably a fair number of people who were phoned it in to be honest but I think there was some real effort that went into this one. Even the sh- scenes of, like, the fucking toys, it's, like, it's it's kind of silly. Like, I compare it to Lean Cara's work a little bit, where you're just kind of, like, working with what you have in your house to do a fight scene. But they went all out with it. They, the, in the yeah, those fight scenes near the end do drag on a bit. But there's just something a lot more, I don't know, I, I like I said, it's just something more, like, with the homemade feeling of it that I appreciate. Although I will say, edited in this movie... Um, had some pretty big fucking issues at points because during that fight scene near the end, it's like every couple frames they just put a white frame in there, and I don't know what the fuck they were thinking even back then. That looks horrible. It's gonna give anyone with epilepsy cannot watch this movie, <laughs> and um, and even for me, it irritated the hell out of me. And they eventually stopped, but now it's inconsistent. So I have the feeling that they saw what they worked on, realized, ooh, that doesn't look good. And then just decided to not continue doing it for the rest of the scene. But they didn't want to redo the work. <laughs> Any of the work they already finished. <laughs> or they already just permanently damaged something. I don't know. This, these are the old days of filmmaking. It's a lot harder to go back and fix a scene, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. But it was terrible during that part. Like, I like not, not like kind of in like a funny observation way. Like, oh, I can't believe they didn't do this. I was like, ow, this actually hurts to look at. Fucking stop. Yeah, it's it's really no seeker with this one. Star Crash is better. Yeah. We did get a lengthy talk out of it again, though. We did. We did. Like, there's maybe a few things I could say Battle Beyond the Stars does better. But overall, they're, like, pretty equal in, in like, how well made they are. And Star Crash is just infinitely more interesting. It is infinitely more charming. It has so much more going on. <laughs> Battle Beyond the Stars is just kind of eh. Weirdly, though, it, it, it was a very close vote um, this time. Only 35 votes, which is, like, less than normal. But uh, that's 49 for Battle Beyond the Stars, 51 for Star Crash. So it was close. But it is unanimous. The two of us and the audience, together, Star Crash wins. Hooray. Uh, I'm just gonna, like, re-record what I said last time and use your genuine reaction to finding out what the next Hall of Victories is, because I think it was very funny. Okay. I want to save that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, here's that. Alright, next time on Hall of Victories, I, I, I don't want to do this one. I thought of this matchup, and it pissed me off. Because it's such a good matchup. Like, we have to do this. We have to do this one. But I don't want to watch either of these movies. These are two animated sequels who decide to spend most of their runtime in the digital space that end up feeling like uh, an advertisement for the company that made them and all the stuff they own, just showing off all the their IPs. It's It's... Wreck-It Ralph 2, Ralph Breaks the Internet, versus Space Jam 2, A New Legacy. Oh. Oh. 
I'm... It's not gonna be fun, but I'm looking forward to the discussion. I I think it's gonna... I'm gonna hate watching them too, but it's one that I... I I'm kind of looking forward to it too, because this is one of those things I can... I can go on about this one. Like, uh, this will be a top... This will be a conversation piece. They're not the worst movies I've ever seen, but... I think both of them, like the first time I saw both of them, I gave it a five. I would have ever since lowered those scores, but it's just like some of the most substanceless <laughs> material out there. Like there's just, they, like they have almost, they have almost nothing to say. I almost feel like I know which one's going to win in my head now, but I, I, I got to rewatch them because it is kind of close. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, that, I, I'm, you know what? I'm looking forward to it. I think that'll be an interesting episode and I don't think either of them are that long. I think they're both like an hour, 30 minutes. Oh God, Space Jam 2 is almost two hours. What the fuck? I'm looking at Ralph Bricks the internet now to see if... I... That one's almost two hours. <laughs> okay, I was completely fucking wrong. <laughs> Anyways, for my co-host Mackle Shadackle, I'm Matt Presents. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.